Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. I'm your host, as always, Dr. Karen Wyatt, and I want to thank you for joining me here today in this video. I am sharing with you a conversation I had with Barbara Carnes, who is a longtime hospice nurse, the author of Gone From My Sight, the Little Blue Hospice Book that gets handed out to almost every family who comes into hospice. And Barbara's my recurring guest, of course, you may know if you've been listening for a while. In this conversation, we talk about dealing with anger at the end of life, and I think you'll find it really helpful. So stay tuned. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to this channel down below and click the little bell if you want to receive notifications whenever a new episode is posted online. Also, be sure and subscribe and leave a rating and review wherever you happen to listen to the podcast. And if you're so inclined, if you could make a small financial contribution to help keep this channel and the podcast on the air, you can go to eoluniversity.com slash support. And there you'll find three different ways you can make a, comp a contribution of just a few dollars that will make a big difference. So thanks in advance if you choose to do that. And we'll move on with my interview with Barbara Carnes. <laughs> Today, I'm so very happy to welcome back my recurring guest, Barbara Carnes. It's always a pleasure when Barbara comes on to join me and we have great discussions about issues relating to hospice care. So um, we're both so happy to be together again. For those of you who may not be familiar with Barbara, I always, I can, I can never imagine that anyone doesn't know about Barbara's work, but I will read her bio for you so you can get to know her if, if you haven't met Barbara before. She is an internationally recognized author, speaker, thought leader, and expert on end-of-life care and the dynamics of dying, having been a hospice nurse for a number of years. Barbara was recognized in 2018 as a hospice innovator by the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization and was named the 2015 International Humanitarian Woman of the Year by the World Humanitarian Awards, which is phenomenal to get that kind of international recognition. Barbara is the author of Gone From My Sight, The Dying Experience, affectionately referred to in the industry as the Little Blue Hospice Book. And if you work in hospice, you probably have stacks of the Little Blue Book in your office to give out to families. Gone From My Sight has sold over 30 million copies worldwide, is published in 12 languages, and remains the leading resource on the market today, educating families on the signs of approaching death. Barbara's most recent book is By Your Side, a guide for caring for the dying at home. And uh, you can find more about Barbara's work at her website, which is bkbooks.com. So Barbara, welcome and thanks for joining me once again. Thank you. I look forward to this. I think we have some good conversation. Yeah, me too. It's always like my, my favorite time when it's time to talk with Barbara again. And uh, uh, Barbara and I had thought a good topic to discuss might be dealing with anger at the end of life and and anger can come in many forms for many different people. So we thought maybe we would just share some of our thoughts and our experiences about dealing with anger. And I don't know, maybe we could could start, Barbara, with um, a few times I've encountered patients who were very, very angry at the end of life. And um, I, I, we haven't, I don't always hear people talk about the reality of the presence of anger because we, we like sharing our stories of how beautiful things are, but anger is often present in different forms when people are dying. Oh, definitely. And, you know, in, in the process of dying, we're going, our personality simply intensifies. It doesn't change. And there are many of us who have kind of that anger underneath the surface kind of personality well, once you've been told you can't be fixed and death is approaching, that anger can intensify and it can be downright verbally lashing. I remember one guy who would wave his cane at me and I was literally concerned he was going to hit me with it. And so I had to address that 
And I don't know if it was as diplomatic as it could have been, but I said, if you raise your cane to me again, I'm out of here. You know, we can talk, we can interact, but you can't threaten me physically. And those things happen. Mm -hmm. And it really isn't the patient's fault. And I put that in quotes. Um, it's just trying to live um, with the news that life is going to end. Yeah. And it can really make you angry. It's a normal reaction when you think about it. And I remember one younger patient we had who was very angry. He was taking out his anger on his mother and sisters who were his caregivers. But I, I remember sitting with him and just validating like, this sucks. It sucks to be your age and to be facing dying. And I totally understand why you'd be angry. And it was interesting the moment I could normalize that for him. Like it, it's, it's everyone would feel angry in your situation. It helped him relax a little bit. And then I, I remember I asked him like, how do you want your mother and your sisters to remember you? Mm -hmm. And as we talked about it, he realized, I don't want them to remember me as angry. And I said, because maybe then you can move past it a little bit and maybe you could try to have more positive interactions. And, um, but it, it is important that we acknowledge it and that, that we not get triggered by it when someone else is angry at the same time, but set boundaries as you had to, when, especially if we're being threatened in some way. Well, and it's hard for us who are not in the patient's shoes uh, to really um, appreciate the emotions and feelings that they're having. And as you pointed out, it's getting them to verbalize, to get them to see, number one, to just express, you know, this is what I'm feeling. Without us, the caregiver or the professional judging them or reacting to their anger. And that's what we tend to do, or at least I do when someone's angry, then I go into my own defensive shell. And we professional caregivers have to remember it's not about us. Mm -hmm. It's not really being directed to us. It's, it's the volcano coming out and it doesn't have anything to do with us. And we can use our communication skills, our people skills that we're trained in to address the volcano um, and try and get some support as well as understanding there for the patient. That's so true. And I I know if ever I felt triggered by someone else's anger, I knew that's me and that's something I need to work on because maybe this situation reminds me of something from my past that's coming up and that's why I'm feeling angry myself or I'm reacting. And just as you said, we have to kind of be above that and be able to manage our own emotions and whatever's happening within me is this because this person reminds me of my mother or, you know, then I need to look at that and do my work on, on my emotions in order to not, not engage them. Well, and I think that's very important. It's also why we're professionals, mm -hmm. you know, that's part of our training uh, too. Now in part of our training, I want to say that it's not always about the patient you know, that we can get anger directed at us mm -hmm. because we're safer um, for the family to direct their anger at us rather than the patient. And so I think as professionals, we have to look and see what's the real source of the anger. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. And I, and I will say I've, I've been through a number of experiences where family members have, have taken out their anger on the hospice staff. They might pick out one particular staff member that they get angry at, or sometimes they were just angry at all of us, no matter what we did. And so that took a lot of processing 
on our part as a team as well to try to understand, did we do something to offend them? Did, did, you know, is there anything we need to be apologizing for? Or is this family just ventilating their emotions about how upsetting the situation is? Well, and I think we, the professional outsider that's coming into the home is the safest person to put the anger on. You know, I may, I'm angry that dad's dying. I'm angry that he smoked for 30 years and now he's got cancer of the lung, but I don't want to be angry at him, mm -hmm. even though I am. And so then we look around and think, yeah, well, this hospice, I got to tell you, they're just awful. And that's because we're projecting those feelings that we don't feel we can put them where they belong. Yeah. And, and in some ways, I guess that's part of our role in hospice in a way, like we're safe people. Um, we provide a safe container where people can feel their emotions and express them, even if they're displaced and even if they're projected onto us, we can um, allow that for a while because in a way it might be helpful to the family temporarily if they can get the anger out in order to, to get beyond it. Oh, absolutely. And we're the professional and we have to remember that, that it's not about us. Yeah. And I know you've written about when families, when family members conflict with each other, which is also very common, um, conflict about decisions that have been made or, um, you know, about choice choices for mom or dad or a loved one and how they're, how they're being cared for. And so I was wondering what thoughts you have about that, about how we can interact and help families when they're having conflict with each other. I will often sit down with the family without the patient and talk about anger and talk about how there's no perfect family, that we all have difficulties and challenges, and that dad's illness and dad's approaching death is like holding a magnifying glass with the sun shining through and it intensifies all the feelings and all the emotions that as family members, we've probably kept under the surface and it just has intensified. So we look at that first and help them sort that through, not that it's good or bad, this is what it is. So now can you put this on hold and help dad have a really special time. You can pick up all the conflict after he's gone, but can you do this for him? Mm -hmm. And some can and some can't. Oh, I, I love that. And that's such a good way to put it to families and to help them come back to this moment and this reality, even though what they're feeling may be old emotions from long ago in the past, but this is not the time to be trying to settle those old scores. Now is the time when they need to be there caring for and being, being with their loved one. Yeah, that's that. What we try to help families see is that let's create a very special sacred memory Mm -hmm. experience experience for dad memory for us so put your own agenda on the shelf and then if you don't want to talk to any of them for the rest of your life fine but think about dad right now and what gift can you give him oh I really like that I I was remembering one case where I got called to meet with a husband whose wife was um, being cared for in a nursing home, but she was in the last week or so of her life. And he'd been angry since the moment she got admitted there and had really caused a lot of disturbances for the whole staff of the nursing home. Um, really like throwing temper tantrums and yelling at all the staff, yelling at the director of the nursing home. And they were threatening to discharge the patient because they couldn't put up with his behavior. And our staff was angry at him because they'd received that treatment too. So this was my chance to go visit because I hadn't met him yet. Um, but 
I realized when I got there, if I respond to him, like I already, I felt angry before I ever met him. Like this man is causing all these problems and it's interrupting my day. And I have to go to this nursing home to meet with him. And I don't, and what am I going to do about it? But I calm myself down and realize it doesn't help if I bring my emotions into it. I have to get into a, a calm space. And when I did that, he expressed to me right away how that he was just hurting. He was just hurting because his wife was dying. And as soon as I could just sit with him and let him talk all about his sadness and his grief and his pain, and and he got over his anger because what he really needed to express was how how much he was hurting and grieving and it was coming out as anger, but that it wasn't real anger because there wasn't really anything wrong in, in the way she was being cared for. Well, bottom line, he needed a listener mm -hmm. and you gave him that ear so that he could verbalize and feel understood. Because I think of a lot of time with our anger, um, for whatever we're angry about, part of that is we don't feel we're being heard or we're not being understood. And so if, if we can be a listener, we don't have to have an opinion. We just have to listen and encourage a person to download, to get this out, um, where the anger is really kind of like a boiling pot. All of the feelings are have come to a, a boil and they're boiling over and we can be the listener. And that that's a really good point that sometimes we just have to, we have to calm ourselves down and then take the time to listen, just be present and listen. Cause we may go in with an agenda. Like I have to get this man to stop stop being mad at the staff and yelling at the staff. But if we leave our agenda behind and can just be there and let him lead and talk about what he needs to talk about, that might actually get us to a peaceful place more quickly. Oh, absolutely. And if we go in with our own agenda, then we're doing that person a disservice. Because it's like, I, I know how this is going to work and I've got my words and I have my own agenda. That may not be his agenda um, until I'm quiet and listen and hear him, truly hear him. Can I then help facilitate some healing and some calm? And I think sometimes, I mean, some patients and their families do die with in anger, with anger still present. And we have to be able to accept that too, that we may not, you know, we may desire to create this peaceful time at the end of life, but we may not be able to make that happen. Such a good point. Most of us who work um, in the healing profession, in the health profession, our fix it personalities. And so give me a problem and I'm going to try and solve it. And I think we have to um, be more receptive and recognize that we aren't going to be able to fix everything. Um, and that's a part of our personality that we have to look at and work with. Yeah. And sometimes we may, we may have to grieve a little bit in our own profession that we can't we can't fix things that we would like to fix sometimes we can we can make things better and we can make a big difference but we can't always and we have to be able to live with that and not get discouraged and not get um, burned out by it or or feel depressed in our work by that yeah oh you know as you're talking I'm thinking of this family that I worked with and the first nurse that went lasted about a week and the family called and said how awful she was. And there were only two of us. So um, we got a psychologist to go in and talk with the family. They were so, so angry and they were putting it all on hospice. And so they finally agreed to let me, the only other nurse, come and take care of mom. And that lasted maybe a month 
before I came into the office one day and the director said, Barbara, you're not to go near such and such. If you go as close as their front door, they're going to put a restraining order on you. Oh you are awful. And so that was the end of hospice with that family, which is really, really sad. But it taught me that we can all do our best. And sometimes it's not enough to, to deal with the anger that people carry. That's so very true. And, you know, I think we know that in other parts of our lives, too. We know we can't fix people in other settings around us and that it's true in hospice as well. We may we may just have to live with some distressing circumstances and maybe sometimes we have to withdraw and not be part of the care if that's what the family chooses. Well, and being the, the fix-it personality I am, I've got this mental vision that I'm this knight on a shining horse <laughs> and I'm riding in to save the day. And if I haven't saved the day, then there's something wrong with me. And I haven't done uh, enough. And I think we have to look and say, we can give it our best. And if that's not enough for that person, that's on them, not us, so that we can continue to do our work. Yeah, that's so very true. And um, you and I were also discussing that another um, source of anger sometimes in the setting is, is caregivers can feel anger about their situation or even anger toward their loved ones, especially if they've been giving care for a long time. And, and that's something else that's really important that we be able to address. Well, and caregivers, whether it's the wife, whether it's the family, you know, that personal in-home family caregiver kind of gets lost in the shuffle in that all the attention goes to the patient, but it's the caregiver that's fixing the meals, that's cleaning the house, that's getting them up at three o'clock in the morning. And yet no one really pays attention to the caregiver. And that caregiver can get really angry. I'm angry that he's sick. I'm angry that I have to do all this work. I'm angry that nobody notices me or says thank you. And that anger, as soon as we start feeling it as a caregiver, then we start feeling, do I even want to say shame? Kind of like shame on me for mm -hmm. feeling these feelings. And so I'm not going to tell anybody how really angry I am at this whole life situation. And so I keep my mouth shut and then I become very, very depressed mm. because anger held inward becomes depression. And I think we see that in a lot of caregivers because the caregiver gets lost in the whole picture and we need to be aware of that and support them more. It's so true. I was thinking even in our society as a whole, caregivers are somewhat invisible. And I think when people know, oh, there's this person is sick and they're being cared for at home, they have no clue how hard the caregiver is working to provide that care. And it's just, it's not recognized or dealt with. Caregivers don't get very much appreciation or or credit for what they do and how many sacrifices they make. And so it's really important that if we come into the picture that we be able to validate caregivers for what they're feeling, everything that they're feeling. And again, as you said before, without judging that. Yes, we, you know, the there must be something wrong with me as a giver. Um, this is huge because we hold it all inside. I'm certainly not going to tell anyone else how angry I am. Uh, and yet 
oftentimes that angry is anger is so appropriate. You know, we often treat our patient, we allow our patients to act like spoiled children. And because they're sick, we let them behave poorly. And that is a point of anger also uh, for the caregiver um, is I have to do all of this. And then he's not even nice to me. Um, and But I'm not going to tell anyone because that'll look badly on me. So we, the professionals, need to really be aware and recognize that the caregiver is as much of our job as the patient. And what do you ever recommend something more for caregivers? I mean, validating their feelings is the is the beginning. But have, have you ever recommended like you need to take a respite week? You need a week off. We can you know we can get other care for your loved one, but but you just you need time for yourself. Oh, absolutely! Respite care is a great um, provider of comfort. Um, and I think that also in acknowledging the frustration and anger of the caregiver, yes, the respite, but there's also as healthcare professionals, us going into the kitchen, having a cup of coffee and sitting there with them and letting that caregiver verbalize by saying, you know, I bet you you're angry about such and such. How do you feel about that? To give open the door so that they can then walk through it and download. Sometimes we have to open the door first. Have you had any luck with getting other family members to step up and be more helpful to the caregiver to get more involved and engaged by just helping them recognize the stress the caregiver is under. I think it's part of our job. Oh, remind me to say social worker. I think it's part of our job to address and support and guide all the family members. And when you we see a caregiver wearing out, it's let's have a family meeting. Let's see who can help. Here's the situation. Now let's try and support mom. How can we do that? That's part of our job is to bring that family together and to get help. And I knew if I told you to remind me about social worker that I'd remember. <laughs> um, and that is when the patient or the caregiver is having struggles. That's what our social workers are for. You know, get that social worker to come in on a regular basis so that they can be a, the family can have a sounding board. And developing that relationship with the social worker, I think is really important and is not taken advantage enough as I'd like to see it. That's that's very true, because I, I, I know oftentimes the social worker makes one visit, it does their assessment, and then that's it. But you're right, they can be such a valuable resource. Oh, absolutely. And, and we tend to forget that. Uh, and that's really sad, because um, the social worker is trained even more in communication skills, in conflict resolution than the nurses. You know, the nurses is, is more of the physical, um, but your social workers, they're the ones that are really trained in communication skills and dyna family dynamics. That's such a good point. And the social worker, in a way, because they don't have to do the other physical assessments, um, in a way, they have more dedicated time where they can actually spend and get to the bottom of some of the issues and really be a source of support. Yes. And, you know, as we're talking about social workers um, and support, we can also talk about chaplains. You know, chaplains are also taught in conflict resolution and listening skills and communication. 
and we underutilize them as well. I think most people think about chaplains and then they think religion and chaplains really have nothing to do with religion. Uh, it's the, the well-being of the person. And so they're a good resource also. And, and I'm curious to know if you ever dealt with conflicts among the staff, the hospice staff themselves, when um, particular staff members just couldn't get along with each other. I mean, that happens in every workplace, but it seems like in hospice, we we don't have a lot of room for that because we're all um, under pressure to be giving compassion and gentle caring to all of our patients that it may be hard to find room when we have we have conflicts with other people that we're working with. And that, you know, part of life is we're not going to be attracted to or even like everyone. But I think as professionals, we have to put our personal feelings toward a, 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 a co-worker. We have to rise above that. Now, if we absolutely can't, then I'd go to my supervisor and say, I'm having a real hard time here and talk to a social worker and, and verbalize, let that social worker be your support person mm. and don't just carry it all inside because if you do, then it's going to bubble up and come out, but talk to someone about those feelings so you can put them in order. That's a really good point because the social workers are a resource to the staff as well and chaplains as well. And, you know, we can, I mean, this is hard work that we do when we're dealing with end of life issues. And so it makes sense that we need to view ourselves as a team, but know that not everyone on the team is going to be having a good day. And we, it's important when we can show up for each other and offer support. Well, and we need to use our people skills with our staff and with our coworkers, just like we use our people skills with our families and the patients. Mm -hmm. that, that's such a good point. And in a way, when you think about it, we have the perfect interdisciplinary team to come together um, that we should be able to skillfully work through any conflicts that do arise and then also even brainstorm because i i've seen that happen at interdisciplinary team meetings where we would brainstorm together how do we help this family where there's so much anger going on and so much blame who's the best person how do we work together and how can we help them get through this time well and that's the brilliance of the interdisciplinary team. That's such a, an integral part of end of life care is having all these different disciplines coming together and talking about and brainstorming how to take care of this patient and family. It's not about one person going out and coming back and saying, here's the game plan. It's that team effort mm -hmm. that I think provides more comprehensive care. And that's part of the beauty of hospice. Yeah, it's true. And then we can work together because maybe one person is having a harder time interacting with a family and maybe others can, we can shift the load a little bit and let somebody else go into the home. Well, like you did with the, the family that was angry. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't get a restraining order. That's real. <laughs> that's no. that's really surprising, <laughs> but you just never know how people will, how people will receive these experiences in life. And I think as a caregiver, as a professional uh, working in end of life, when we have a family or a patient or a specific person that we're not comfortable with or we're having feelings about, we need to look inside of ourselves and say, what is this person triggering within me? because um, they're pushing a button that we may not even be aware of. And yet they're 
if it weren't something within us that is uncomfortable, um, then we wouldn't be feeling the way we are. So we need to look and see, you know, I don't deal with anger well. And so when there is anger around me, I get terribly uncomfortable, but I recognize that's me and it has nothing to do with the people that are angry. Mm -hmm. so I think we need to look in and see what button is being pushed within us. Yeah, that's so true. And it makes sense. Any of us could be sensitive in any situations. I had a hospice nurse recently told me she she herself has young children and she cannot work with pediatric patients in hospice because it's too upsetting for her. She gets too emotional and she can't be there for the families because she goes into her own place of fear and anxiety and and grief. And I think it's important for each one of us to know ourselves really well so we know what can we handle. Well, and we who work in end of life are kind of an unusual kind of bear in that most people can't do what we can do. And I think that most of us do the work that we do because we do have an understanding of ourselves. Not only have we learned communication skills, but we've learned self-care um, skills as well. Mm -hmm. And anything we apply to our patients and their families, we can apply to our life and our living and our families. Yeah, very, very true. Yeah, I would say um, actually doing hospice work and working with angry patients helped me learn how to tolerate anger because like you, I, my family was very reserved and quiet and didn't show anger. I never really learned how to be in a situ to be comfortable in a situation where people are angry until I worked in hospice and it actually helped me learn and grow. Oh, you know, I have a similar, uh, and situation in that anger was never okay. Um, you know, you couldn't express it, you held it in and you went on about whatever. And so I didn't learn how to deal with anger until I learned how to deal with anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's one of the examples how working in hospice, it's this really great opportunity to know yourself better and to grow in so many ways as your own person well and you know and maybe this is just my thoughts but end of life work gives us the opportunity I mean to really appreciate our life and life itself you know we're constantly reminded how short life is and most of us live on this gerbil wheel that we just go round and round and do the same thing every day. End of life work shows us, you know, stop and get off the wheel. Look at the shine, look at whatever, uh, appreciate life as you have it because it's very short. And that's the gift for, at least for me, working with end of life. Mm -hmm. That's so very, very true. So, and it can be that gift for families who are taking care of a loved one too, but they just might need a little help recognizing that or, or seeing that. So our patient understanding and compassion for them, you know, may help them, may help calm down their anger and help them get to a, a place where, where they can grow as well. And, and really make the most of this opportunity of being with their loved one. Well, and part of our work is to assess family dynamics, to assess the patient and family's mental place, and then develop a plan on how to help them live the best they can, but to help and to help them have a special experience. And that's our expertise that will guide them in that. And that's assessing 
the mental, the, mo the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual aspects of not just the patient, but of the family as well. That's our work. Yeah, that's so true. And, um, and understanding, like, of course, people are going to feel angry because life, life, when life doesn't turn out the way you'd hoped, and when you have to cope with something tragic and uh, a, a really huge loss that's coming in your life, of course, anger is part of that reaction. And, and so people can be, they might even be angry at themselves, or they might be angry at the whole medical system. I've seen that before. And I've seen people say they're angry at God. You know, some people who say, oh, I believed in God and I trusted God and God let me down because this happened. So in all of those situations, uh, we have to be able to just hear it and listen to what they have to say uh, and do whatever we can to kind of walk them through that experience of anger. Well, the anger, we start looking for a hook, some place to put all this anger. In our society today, anger really isn't that acceptable. We've made it that it's not acceptable. And so when we're feeling it, we often think, well, there's something wrong with me. Um, and oftentimes we don't even think anything about it. We just are angry and we don't even realize what we're projecting because we're so numb inside or are so frightened or whatever those feelings are. Sometimes we don't even realize we're being sharp uh, or projecting anger, uh, but it, it's uh, very much a part of being a human being. Yeah. Well, um, for me personally, like I, I started a practice of just journaling. I do a, a lot of journaling and I did it all, all through my hospice days too, which was sort of my way of self-therapy in a way, or, or actually just talking to myself about what happened. Do you have any practices like that, that you've used to help you? What, what I had and I recommend today was a buddy. You know, I had other people in the end of life arena that would understand and I strongly recommend that all of us have that buddy, someone we can call and say, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what just happened. Here's what I'm feeling. Someone we can download with rather than carry those feelings inside. Because if we carry them inside, they will come out somewhere, whether it's anger, whether it's illness, you know, it will come out we figure out how to get our feelings out. And so journaling is, is wonderful. I journaled for years and years and it was the best therapy ever. Um, in fact, I just got rid of my journals hmm. and I'm very old and I've had them for years and years and I just got rid of them. And as I was reading back over them, it was like, oh my goodness. You know, just, it was really an interesting thing. So uh, bottom line is whether it's journaling, whether it's coming home and going in your closet and screaming, you know, some way that you can find to let those emotions out so that you don't carry them and they come out in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it makes me think that maybe for hospice staffs, like anger should be kind of a regular topic that comes up and even having, um, you know, staff training on how to handle your own anger, how to handle patient and family anger, so that we keep normalizing it. And we don't stuff it away because I think that, I think that happens all the time. And when we're, as you said, we're fix it people, but we also view ourselves as kind, compassionate, caring people. And anger doesn't fit very well in how we view ourselves or how we should behave or, or what we should be feeling. And so I think that it's really important that we acknowledge it. Uh, we tend to carry so many shoulds around. Shoulds get really heavy. And so um, I, we have to give ourselves a break. We have to be gentle, as gentle with ourselves 
as we are with other people. Yeah, very, very true. So, so important. And um, maybe hospice administrators need to, maybe they need to find ways to help people find a buddy. May, I don't know if it's good to have your buddy be someone you work with, or if it's better if it's somebody outside your own workplace well, you know, who understands. That, that's a tough one in that I learned early on when I was come home with my husband and tell him what was going on. And it's finally, he said, I can't hear this stuff. You can't tell me this. So every Friday night, there was a group of about five or six of us that went to the local Mex Mexican restaurant and over margaritas, we shared and we talked and that was a way of unloading. And um, I think find your people, find your peeps that you can be real with. And not everyone can understand and hear what you're saying. So you got to be selective. Uh, but for sure, don't walk this road alone. Hmm. I love that idea of the hospice happy hour every Friday and ha just have a place where, as you said, you can be real and you can express what you're feeling because that's, that's just the best to share it with others is the very best way to carry some of these burdens that, that come to us as part of our work. Oh, absolutely. All right. Well, what, a, this has been a great discussion talking all about anger and how it affects us on the job and um and just recognizing that it's it's okay to be angry and it's okay it's okay if we are feeling it and if patients and families are feeling it it's okay and that we're actually big enough we can hold it we can we can allow someone to be angry and sit with it and hold it and it's not really threatening to us it's just an emotion that's there well and it's normal it's not pathological. It's not bad. You're not a bad person. They're not a bad person. It's normal to have these feelings where the challenge comes is to not carry them inside, to get them out, find your person uh, so that you don't carry it or find your way to let go. It's normal. Nothing bad is happening. Yeah. Uh, when you're angry. Um, you just need to find a way to put it in order. Yeah, that's a very good point. And it, it just occurred to me, if we're, if we're working with families that have children, children also can be carrying feelings of anger that they don't understand at all. And it may come out in ways of acting out. And so it's probably important that we acknowledge that or remind parents to allow their children children to express if they might be feeling angry about the situation that they're in as well. Oh, good point. Good point. Because children tend to get lost in the shuffle mm -hmm. and think that, oh, well, they're doing their thing. They don't know, but they do. You know, there's eyes and ears on you all the time. Uh, and so we need to take them into our embrace our circle of support. Um, they may appear to be invisible off watching their phone, but they're listening to everything and we have to support them and guide them. And that could be another good place for the social worker to get involved too, to specifically to work with any children in the home that, that are naturally are being affected by everything that's happening, but may have no idea how to talk about it. And we tend to want to protect them. Uh, we're not protecting them by not including them. You know, we're just giving them challenges down the road in life. And so we definitely need, and as you said, the social worker is a great person to start with. Yeah, who might even have like activities, books, coloring books, things that children can do that can help them to express express all their feelings, anger, sadness, fear, whatever might be present for them. Absolutely. Good point. I'm glad you remembered that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because it was just making me think that working, giving a family books 
to read to their children about expressing anger might actually end up being helpful to the rest of the family who might find, oh, uh, <laughs> I needed to hear that. As I was reading this book to my child, I realized that's actually what's happening inside of me. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Well, Barbara, thank you once again for having another great discussion with me. It's always fun to tap into all of your wisdom and experience and share our stories together. And I hope it's been helpful to others. I hope so too, because I'm certainly having fun. I so enjoy our back and forth and, and exploring. So thank you for inviting me and having me here. I love it. You're so welcome. And I, I love uh, looking forward to the next time we have a chance to get together and talk. Not too long off. That's right. So okay. I'll see you the next time. Uh -huh. Bye bye. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Barbara Carnes. If you're a regular listener, you might know that she's a recurring guest. So she'll be back again in two months uh, for another interesting conversation. And I'll be back next week with another interview for you. So until then, take care and we'll see you then.